Yo, 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 what's up everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brothers in Arms, a new way for men to talk, I am your host, comedian Edgar Rivera, and I am joined today by comedian Eric Nieves and Dr. Dan Ratner, what's up brothers? Great to see you, Edgar. Uh, good to see you, what's up Eric? How you doing Edgar, how's everything going out in uh, your part of the world? <laughs> that was so weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, How's it going out there? <laughs> it's like he had nothing to say. He was like, huh? How? Well, I, you know, because <laughs> I remember the last time we, we were doing the introductions like a hot potato. So I yes. wanted to make an effort to really do genuine conversations because last week we were like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Next. So I wanted to really <laughs> saw, have a warm me. I was like, wow. I was like, oh reception. my God, he asked me a question. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm doing good, man. I'm doing, I'm doing great. Uh, schools are open. So traffic is yeah. back. That's the only thing that bothers me. Traffic is back. That's it. That's like it. That. What about you, Dr. Dan? Well, it's funny because I was thinking about it. Going into this show, you know, we're, we're back, the three of us. It's, mm-hmm. We had two guests. And I was th- this is the one part of the show that I was thinking about. Hmm, maybe I... Because I feel like I've, I've said the same thing twice. And I felt... I said what I felt, that like it's all... I'm just in a blur. But today I'm in a totally different state. Nice. Um, I, I'm actually nervous. And I'll tell you, I, because I'm going to be walking the walk. But I'm... But I'm I didn't get nervous when I walked the walk the first two times. I am about this one, so we'll have to explore what that's about. I think I know what it is, but do you that's think where it's I'm at. Because, do you think it's because we've seen, um, we, we, Eric and I have both done it a few times, and we had a couple of guests walk the walk, so do you think now it's like you've gone into your head deeper with it, or, you know? No, I don't think, I, I understand why you'd ask that, but actually it's more that um, this is a topic that I'm worried you guys will not understand why I suffered as much as I did. Uh, which is its own thing. Uh, you know, that's its own thing in, in talking. You know, we have to get used to talking in ways where we're kind of in our own corner and we can be like, look, I know you may not think this was a big deal, but here's what it was like. And that it's different than the other ones. Like when I tell you my father died when I was a baby, the chances are somebody's going to may- maybe understand that. When I told you about, you know, having my heart broken when I was 13 and that it lasted much longer than people might have expected... Even that, this one's a little different. You'll see. All right, cool. I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm really looking forward to it. I've been good, man. I'm excited this week. Um, I have a, a couple of new sh- a couple of shows this weekend, and um, I gotta be honest with you guys. Ever since ever since I started this podcast, and, and, and even meeting you, Doctor Dan, and working with you on the in, in the Crushing Doubt and, and the other platforms, it, it's changed me a lot as a man. You know, like now I see a difference in how to help people. And when I say sometimes we don't need to help them, we just need to listen and try to understand where they're coming from. And if they're in a messed up place, help them, and you know, let them know that you know that. And it's been helping me a lot and it's making a, a whole different man of me. And I'm very happy that that, I, that we're doing this, man. You know, um, we had a couple of guests. We had um, Nick Alexander and Momo Rodriguez. For this episode, we felt like we just needed to go back to ourselves and, you know, regroup, see how we felt about having two guests. Let Dr. Dan walk the walk since he desperately wants to walk that walk and, you know, and, and, and get to, you know, get to know each other better for next week when we bring in that next guest. So moving along, we're going to take it right in. We're going to go right in. So, um, Eric, you ready? But before you're ready. ready, you know, I got I to gotta let Dr. Dan do it. I just asked you if you're right. ready because <laughs> Eric takes over the news, but Dr. Dan introduces the news. All go right, ahead. Eric, here, this, this is for you guys. All right. We're going into old news, maybe from yesterday. Do, 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 do. Hey, right, you Eric. gotta make the face. You gotta go along with the face, not go just do 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 do. You gotta try to <laughs> oh, go on. Man. And by the way, you know I just want to say I, that. Uh, no, no, hold on, um, hold on, Eric. You know what? Let's show people that that's how we do it. If we we, we, we we spoke and we need to listen, so let's take it back for the top. Rewind, okay, Eric. Rewind. Here we go again. We all, not the same face, just our version of it. All right, cool. Go for it. Cool. Go ahead, Doctor Dan. Okay, guys, it's time for old news, maybe from yesterday. Yeah. Okay. That was a... <laughs> By the way, I just want to say that I think uh, I think Edgar has known Dr. Dan for what about a year or two? And, less, and ha- less, less, less than, than that, a year. and had and had such a profound impact on him. And I've known Edgar for twenty years and have had little to no <laughs> impact on him. So I just. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Oh, that's not hey, true, wait, brother. Hold on. Hold on. I'm, just, hold on. I'm <laughs> kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. Take it as a joke. Oh, okay. It's funny. All right. We're going to defend right. you here, Eric. I know, but you don't know, <laughs> I'm from just your own kidding. Jokes. I just thought it was hilarious. Like, yo, you impacted my life. And now here's Eric. I've known him. 
I'm just playing. I just gotta admit, that was a good one. All right, well, listen, hilarious. Listen, Thank you. Going to old news, man. All right, this is not really old. It's, it's not old. It's new to me today, so it's not really old news. And I found this article in Psychology Today. Uh, psychologists uh, put their opinions forward on their, uh, on their observations of what they considered uh, narcissist behavior in celebrities. Celebrities they felt had a narcissistic personality disorder or NPD, mm -hmm. which is an actual diagnosis. So, you know, some of them, you know, uh, some of them, a lot of people know very well, you know, Kanye West comparing himself to Jesus. That's a, quite a narcissistic fact, you mm -hmm. know, saying that if you've never heard his music, uh, your life will be missing something. That's a little pushing it. Uh, Madonna at one point, uh, one time she claimed to use Kabbalah to remove the radiation out of Ukrainian lake and became upset when the government of the Ukraine said, it's not true, you know what I mean? But she was <laughs> upset, she believed it because she, was, she just had this, this grandiose uh, ver uh, vision of herself that you know, she was just so important and that she knew it all and other people didn't know anything. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to discuss narcissism today. I have a definition of narcissism as a, of the, the disorder, I should say, because narcissism, uh, narcissistic personality disorder it's a personality disorder characterized by a sense of grandiosity, the need for attention and admiration, superficial interpersonal relationships, and a lack of empathy. So that, that's, a, that's the technical definition of the disorder, uh, but you don't, you, know, you don't have to have the disorder to have some narcissistic, narcissistic traits. Um, uh, I do wanna say one stat before we open up the discussion to the whole floor, because obviously this is a show about men. Um, out of, uh, we are, we lead in narcissism, guys. 75% of the cases of, uh, of NPD in the United States are male. Now, that could be mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into, but that number is, uh, is quite staggering. Mm. It is, and it, it definitely, I can tell you just from experience in studying this and also in interacting with people that it does, it does bear out. I, I think I, I like that you highlighted, though, Eric, that there's a difference between narcissistic tendencies, which actually every person has some of. I just want to say that. And narcissistic personality disorder, where it is the dominant feature of their personality. So it's just good to highlight. That's also very rare, by the way. Interesting. We, that, yeah, it only that. affects uh, 6% of the population, according to the stats I read. 6% really? of the population. That's a pretty high number. I was going to say that doesn't sound as rare as I would think. Well, I mean, yep, six six percent of the six percent of the population. That's a pretty high number. Well, but you say it affects six six percent of the population. It if it it affects six percent of people that have it, but it affects a hundred percent of the population in terms of the impact. That's actually a big. Sure. It's an important point because mm -hmm. these people do tend to have a pretty outsized uh, impact on other people, and we'll we'll get into that more as we go. Let's see, because yeah. I've, I've, I've always, um, and I, Edgar, I know you have a question about, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, about narcissism that you were thinking about asking Dr. Dan. Why don't you go ahead and ask? No, no, go ahead. You go first. Finish what you're saying. Well, I mean, you know, actually, my question is, is there, what's the difference between conceit and narcissism? You know, because we know people that are conceited. Does that mean they're narcissistic? Like, is, it, what, is there a line you could draw between the two? Um, that, uh, that's a great question, and I think it's a really important line that we draw. There's even a line between confidence and narcissism. You know, you, mm -hmm. you can have people who say, oh, if they're confident, you're, narciss you're a narcissist. Take a look at, like, Robert Downey Jr. I don't think he's narcissistic at all. I think he actually has a lot of empathy. He's just very confident. It's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think we want to make sure that we don't confuse certain ideas, and that this question speaks to that. Um, to me, it is really about the motiv the motivation for that behavior. If it is, if the motivation is, you know what, I like feeling good about me, I like what I do, and I'm going to be really energized in the world. That's not narcissism. That's confidence. You could even cross over into arrogance if you start to look down on other people about it. But even that isn't going all the way into narcissism. Narcissism is when. You are so lost in that that there is no other person. Uh, in, in psychology grad school, they would teach us, listen, if you're sitting with a narcissist, you'll feel like you're all alone. Like you just do not matter at all. Okay. So there's a whole other level that it gets to. Confidence 
uh, not only doesn't inherently fit with narcissism, it actually has almost nothing to do with it. You know, when, when a narcissist is confident, it's particularly obnoxious, but they're pretty, they're pretty, they're pretty much not related. Okay, so someone could be full of themselves but not have a disorder is pretty much what we're yeah, saying. Yeah, I, I, I was. Let's say it this way: someone could be full of themselves in a certain way, and um, it could be kind of unpleasant to be around. But do they do they carry? It's it's all about how they carry it out. If you take that that feeling and you spread it over the world all the time, that's where you start to get into narcissistic personality disorder. If you're confident in an area of your life and you don't use it to make other people feel bad and instead you use it for good, that has nothing to do with narcissism. That's true. All right, Dr. Dan, I wanted to ask you this. I wanted to ask you is, uh, and by the way, for the viewers, I have a hard time saying narcissism, you know, so if I sound a little weird, <laughs> you did well. I'm, I'm saying it I now. thought it sounded great. Uh, thank say you. it again. Thank you. Say it so again. So if, if you have a narc, <laughs> imagine MPD, you said, right? You said <laughs> a narc. MPD? Oh, oh be careful. A narc that's is what, different. That's, that's somebody said, the, who turns people word? in. Yeah, for if drugs. You, like if you have someone with NPD, that's the NPD. The, act, the short so the name is, for the disorder. Is um is narcissism something that you're born with or you're made or turned uh, into? Right. Okay. Great question. So here's the thing: narcissism, as I see it, is not. I don't even think of it as a disorder. I think of it as a a place in development. If people have not really developed much at all, that's a narcissist. So essentially, we're all born with a lot of narcissistic tendencies. In fact, babies and little kids, they tend to think that everything that happens happens because of them. They'll think the sun set and it's because I did something wrong. Now that's that's not being a narcissist. That means that we have a narcissistic tendency which we all do at those early ages, we think everything revolves around us. If you don't ever grow out of that, then you become an adult narcissist because what happens is everyone else is growing out of that. They're recognizing it's not all about me. So the way to think about narcissism is through a developmental line. I wouldn't say we're all born narcissists. We're all born with narcissistic traits because that's part of how the mind's working when it hasn't even gotten up to speed on what's really happening out there. Narcissism, um, it's kind of neither one, actually. You're not born a narcissist, and you're also not made a narcissist. What ends up happening is we are born with narcissistic tendencies like anybody. And over time, if we don't develop well, yes, you can you can get stuck there. So it's more of a developmental stuckness than it is anything that like the parents necessarily did wrong. You can have great parents and still have somebody grow up to be a narcissist what if because they just a, never a developed. Parent? What's that? What if you have a missing parent as a kid growing up? Is that is that trauma turn could turn someone into a narcissist? That in my in my experience, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, when people have had traumas, it it as long as they can get past them, it helps them to develop. the The trauma helps them to develop. I'm not I'm not saying that's absolutely impossible because it's it is 100 percent possible to have parental loss and somebody becomes a narcissist actually let me say this better it's not it's not I, I said it was the opposite really that's not true i just think that what it relates to more is how is the person dealt with are they helped to develop or not whether they have a parent or not i do think though that trauma tends to lead to two different paths it can lead to a lack of development, which can lead to some of the worst kind of things that happen in society, like narcissism, mm -hmm. full-blown narcissism, or it can lead to some of the best people. All that empathy can come from all that suffering. So it's really interesting. It can go in completely different directions. And I think I think the most helpful thing we can think about this in this, though, is development. It even helps you to pr protect yourself from narcissists to think of it that way. Because instead of thinking of them as like this dangerous person who can harm you, you can recognize they're actually a very little child. Yeah. Okay. Because you know Eric said it good at, in the beginning with, with the difference between the the tendencies. You know, because I believe, and I had this conversation a couple of days ago with a friend of mine, and I was like, I think we are all we all have narcissistic tendencies to a certain extent. You know, that there's the people who actually go for it. 
But then my question to you was, and, and I'm pretty sure a lot of men could relate with this, you know, because we all, and not just men and women, because we all, you know, it's, it's just the number is higher for men, but women could be just as bad as us and being a narcissist. But when you are in a narcissistic <laughs> relationship, right, and you get out of that relationship, do you take those tendencies with you and what you went through in a relationship? Can can someone that is in a narcissistic relationship become a narcissist after getting out of that relationship because that's what they used to? Oh wow, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I oh, yeah, it was deep. I well, I have to. I have to I'm think asking about you this it. question. You know why I'm asking you this question because I've gotten asking. thrown in my face that someone has called me a narcissist. You well, know? actually, and, let me. And, and I think about it, and I'm like, okay, but, you know, go ahead. I, you, go ahead. Well, let me first it. say this. Most people have been called a narcissist at some point, you know, because it gets misused a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. What people just think, if you're selfish, you're a narcissist. Or if you were selfish at a given moment, you were a narcissist. And meanwhile, people are calling people selfish out of something, in psychology terms, we call projection, where the person themselves is feeling selfish, and they say that you are, and now they're calling you a narcissist. So... You can go way down a rabbit hole in thinking there's something wrong with you, especially if you are empathic and you take in people's perspectives. So I just want to clear that up right now, Edgar. You are in no way a narcissist. It's not even close. <laughs> you're not even a narc. You, you're you're not even a... But it's like... <laughs> you're not even a narc. I think you said this earlier. You said um, a narcissistic person would never admit that they are narcissists. Yeah, they but they it's don't funny even worry how they will blame other people for it. Isn't Listen, that crazy? Then they don't even they don't even worry about it. If you find yourself worrying you're a narcissist, you automatically aren't. Just from the fact that you're worried about it. You know, yeah. that's that to me is the biggest difference between having confidence or even arrogance, because arrogance is not a crime either, than to be a narcissist. It's it's the relationships that they have with others and the the ability to feel the pain of others and, and acknowledge that pain. A true narcissist only has their feelings. It doesn't even begin to comprehend that anyone else has feelings. Uh, they, but the irony is they pretend they do, which is, you know, they're, they're really good about pretending that they care what's going on when they absolutely don't because it's all about them. Uh, because mm -hmm. it, as a comedian, I can tell you, and Edgar, you know this, you can't be a comedian without a certain level of, of narcissism and a mm -hmm. sense of self-worth and a mm -hmm. sense of feeling grand about yourself. You're going in front of a room in front of a room full of total strangers and you're telling this room of total strangers, I'm going to make you laugh. And that mm -hmm. takes a certain level of self-confidence and, and maybe even sometimes arrogance if it's needed, but that's what we need to get the job done. And yeah, actually I did another part of my research I found interesting. There are two fields uh, that are very high risk, high intensity, high reward fields that have an extremely high percentage of people that develop or show traits of narcissistic personality disorder, okay? 17% of first year medical students show some sign or have can end up diagnosed with some form of narcissistic personality disorder. And 20% of people in the military. So think about those numbers. Mm. They, you know, think about the confidence that they, a, a first year medical student needs. And I'm sure Dr. Dan can discuss this better than you and I, Edgar, or what's mm. needed to go through boot camp and, you know, think you're going to just, you know, have this militant lifestyle and, you know, ex excel in the military. You need some of these traits. And I think that we can't confuse the positive that these traits bring with the negative that's associated with the word narcissism and the association with uh, narcissist, uh, narcissism personality disorder. I, I think that's, that's really profound and important that you said that because there are positives to narcissistic traits. Um, I think we might even need a new word for it because narcissism is like, it's about as negative a word as you could get. Yeah, I, I hear it and it I just much. recoil. You know, I'm just like, oh my God. And Edgar can't say it that well, so we got to get rid of it. Yeah, this may be the last <laughs> time we talk about take. the Did subject. You see that? <laughs> we'll call them nudists. I'm sure he could say <laughs> nudists. Let's just do that. Because if you're nude, you have you can't be a narcissist if you're naked. So let's just call them nudists for the rest of the show, Fred. But it so really, guess, it really is that. true that a lot of a lot of great art, a lot of the great achievements were were driven at least partially by the the ability that people would have to dream that they could be great. That that does take some. I guess we'll call it narcissism, but it's the positive version of it, the positive side of it. 
the key to me is, is it used to better things for people or is it used to try to crush them so that you can feel better about yourself when you really don't? When you, mm. when you actually feel good about yourself, and let's say it's like maybe a little bit narcissistic in that you think you're better than some people in something, it can lead to great things actually. So in a small dose, it can be a fantastic thing. And I just, I think we should say that. Nice. I think um, I, I want to talk about, this is a good, interesting topic. We'll be here for the whole hour just talking about this, going back and forth. But I want to, just just for the viewers and the listeners, I want I want I want to talk about why you think men suffer more from this, because obviously we're here to talk to men and and find out and you know so that was one question. The other part was when you know someone like that, can you really help them? Two great questions. All right, Let's so go I'll, first with I'll, I'll try to make it fast because then I know we want to get sure, to breaking sure. the mold. So here here's yeah. what I'm thinking. First of all, the thing that I said about development actually answers your first question. People say all the time that women develop quick, uh, quicker than men, and they do. They absolutely do. It's a 100% certifiable fact. I can give you lots of reasons for it. Um, even biologically, they're more advanced in certain ways, partly because if you think about it evolutionarily, it makes sense. If they're going to get pregnant, you know, and evolutionarily, it could happen at like 13. They need to be grow up fast. Mm-hmm. Boys don't grow up that fast. If it's a developmental issue, we are much more likely to have that. Anything developmental, we're more likely to have that show up because we're behind. And so that's one thing. Another thing is that I think men are far more prone to violence. And narcissism, when it is full-blown, is a violent experience. It is, it is, a, it is an acting out of violence on the world because it's, it's taking those narcissistic feelings and enacting them. That's what narcissism is. And men are less developed in general. I'm not saying it is an insult to men. I, I used to get insulted by it, but man, it's true. I joke now true. that I'm the equivalent of a 25-year-old woman. But <laughs> I'm catching up. But the, that's, the, that's the best beard I've ever seen on a woman. You look really <laughs> great, doctor. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to bring out something that I, I learned in my research because I think it pertains to the question, Edgar, about you know, uh, why does it affect men more? I, I, I think you, that could be explained by... How their nar- how nar- how their narcissism is is expressed compared to women. You know, men's narcissism is mostly expressed in power and control, whereas women's narcissism tends to focus more on the on the physical appearance. Now, there was no difference in the level of vanity, of self absorption, or attention seeking. And those behaviors they they both they both lean towards that, whether male or female. But it, the difference is in their expression of power and control in men as opposed to more being, uh, you know, appearance-based for women. Yeah, I mean, you're going you're gonna to see big differences between the genders. I mean, there, there's a lot of differences between men and women. I think we, we find it over time. There's, a lot of sim- there's more similarities than we think, too, which actually is probably a good lead into breaking the mold because we're talking about how are we, how are we different. But I did want to just address your second question, Edgar. Can these people get better? It is very rare for a full-blown narcissist to get the help that they need because they don't want to see it. It it uh, it kind of tries to tear down their narcissism even just to admit that that might be true. So it's actually very rare that these people do get help. What, what usually needs to happen, unfortunately, is we all have to learn to protect ourselves from these people. And yes. that's a pretty sad commentary coming from a therapist who thinks most people can be helped. I do think yeah. these people can be helped. I just think it's much harder. I think this is a great topic. I think we could, like I said, we should definitely um, retouch this topic again, you know, and just to bring awareness to it. Like one, one of the things that a narcissist does, like how to, how to spot uh, that narcissistic behavior in someone, you know, um, but definitely, definitely moving forward, we should definitely talk about this again, man. Thank you for the, thank you for answering those questions. Thank you for bringing this up, Eric. And just sure. to break the ice a little now, let's just do a, a quick break in the mold between the three of us, you know, and um, and then we'll get back into Dr. Dan's walk in the walk. So, you know what? I, I know exactly where to dive in on this because I mean, this is this is just a free flowing discussion about like what what is the mold? But last time I really was struck by that you were and you said this was in this was in a meeting, but I'm going to bring it up right here. You said at some point you're going to get me and Eric to do a Manny Petty. And I was like, 
And, I, and Eric's response was priceless. Come on. Yeah, listen. Uh, I ain't breaking that mold. Oh, sorry. Oh, and by the way, for those of watching for the first time who don't know what breaking the mold is, it's a segment where we just talk about maybe some behaviors or some of our personality traits that may not fall under what society feels is appropriate for men, but it's really to show that we're all men, but we could all be different and we could all have different attributes and they don't have to fall under a cookie cutter definition of what a man is. So we just want to break those old school molds that we don't think should exist anymore. And this is exactly why you and Dr. Dan should do a Manny and Petty with me one day. Listen, one doesn't <laughs> have anything to do with the other. I'm more concerned okay, okay. about the so, poor woman's hands that have to touch these feet. That's yo, but I'm, I mean, I'm that, you know, is that, is that why? Is that how you feel as well, Listen, Dr. Dan? Like what? What? what you, as a man, okay, I'm a, I'm I'm a man who breaks the mold. I, I go once a month and I get my feet done. If I could go every week, trust me, I would. Just to have a, a woman massage my feet and take care of my feet, I would do it every week. But it's different how we're all different. So I want to ask you guys personally, what is it about getting your feet done that is so bad? Like, like, why would you not do that with me? If I was to tell you guys, I'm paying for this. Let's do this. I, I would do it. I, I, I Ooh, it's okay. Okay. You see, the minute I said I'm paying for this, Eric's face changed. Did you see Eric's face? Eric was <laughs> well, like, oh, wait a second. You know, my, my I, 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 have a fo- I have a follow-up <laughs> question for you. What if, what if it was a male would you be as open? Because you said, oh, I love having a woman rub my feet. So what you know, if it was Stan? What if it was right, Stan's right, cool. day to work? I'm going to break the mold and I'm going to get heat for this one. But I go to I go to the nail salon here, same nail salon. And, dude, I'm comfortable with my manhood. I, I don't really care. But I, I went one time and there wasn't a girl available to do my feet. The girl did my hands, but there wasn't a girl to do my feet. And they had a, a little Asian guy. And he uh, he came up to me. He goes, "Do you mind if I do your feet?" And I was like, "I hope he worked there." <laughs> some random guy That's came up. Yeah, somebody, some, some guy just walked up the street. By, hey, you I mind do if I do your feet? <laughs> <laughs> I got a few minutes. No, but you know what? I it was the first time being approached like that. I always told myself, "No, no, I could, I would let women do my feet, but I'm not gonna let a man do my feet." But it was weird when it when it happened because he put me on the spot, you know, and he was nice about it. He asked me. I mean, at least he respected the man code. He was like, look, listen, do you mind if I do your feet? And and I was like, you know what, bro? Knock yourself out, you know? And it was felt like, I, like at first I was like, mm, but then I said, you know what? Why should I feel weird? I'm comfortable with my but sexuality. I have none to hide in this. I, I got to give you some real credit, Edgar, because I there's so few areas that I thought that would come up in breaking the mold that would make me at all uncomfortable. Like my feeling is like, no, 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 I'm fine with whatever. And when you brought that up, I was like, oh, oh, oh my God. What? <laughs> yeah, I saw both for your faces and I was like, yeah. what? I don't know. It's, and I don't even know why. Like that, that's There's one no of the reason. Things. I have no logical reason. It, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, first of all, I know what my feet look like. Second, it's just, you know, if you've never done something and never thought about doing something, the thought of it just is alien to you. No, no, but I, yeah. let me let me throw something out there. I, I'm interested, and we should think about this maybe as as something we think about in breaking the mold in general. Are there things that you wouldn't say to a group of guys? Like that's something that I wouldn't mind. I would do it. I, I have no judgment against it. But I know that if I was standing with a group of guys, I'd have to make it a joke at least. At, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just at this point, you know, like maybe you maybe if like- we. Maybe if we push this far enough, we'll get to a point where it's like, that's just totally normal. But it's it was so interesting to me to notice just within myself that I had a different response than, like, you guys tease me about not knowing hip hop. And, I, like, there, I don't, that doesn't bother me so much at all, but it certainly is a conversation topic. I would, I would be totally fine admitting that to people. But if I were like, not only do I, not only do I get Manny Petties, but I love it. Like, I, I'd have to, it actually, you know what's weird? It would be easier for me if I loved it. Like, if I was like, no, I'm I'm throwing down here. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I don't know why this is the case, but for some, for some people, if you admit you like certain cheesy music, I'll put in quotes, like uh, Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie is amazing. He, he is... He was with, but it's not and a you have, conversation but, but listen to dudes. <laughs> listen to the way I'm talking about it. I'm like, he was with the Commodores. I'm getting all all like defensive of yeah, Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie's awesome. He's easy like Sunday morning. What's wrong with you people? But but you know, some people will tease you about it. They'll, they'll I, who knows why? 
And Christopher Cross would do that too. If you tell people you're a Christopher Cross, that's listener. right. Any any See? yacht rock. Yeah. Any. I think, yeah. Honestly, I think honestly that it's crazy how we done two breaking the molds on Manny and Petty. This is I don't know the breaking the mold it, is. Gonna it shouldn't be, be amazing. That. You brought I'm it up, and you're I and you're paying I, for. No, it. But I, but I brought it you know up what? Because... How about we do this? Because we we eventually are going to be in a studio together. Like right, yes. you know, we haven't been in a studio together yet. And I know that at one point the plan is for the brothers in arms to be in the same room. So, as a very special episode, brothers in arms, we should do the episode while we're getting our mani pedi. From an, oh my god, how cool! I got the perfect place to do it, man. We could get Michael. You know what I mean? Just, no, no, they got to come to the studio with the face oh, shields and all that stuff, dude. and we sit there and we do the show, or we film the, and we just film the show right there in the studio and get it done, and you can see the looks on our faces and how it changes and, our lives. <laughs> that we should. And, <laughs> and, I, and I, I, um. I think about it. I'm like, you know what, man? It's crazy because I, I brought it up to certain of my boys. I'm like, you you crazy, bro? I would never do that. You know? And I was like, dude, why? Why not? Why women go get their nails done every week? There's got to be something good to this. I mean, I'm not saying that I paint my nails. I, I don't paint my nails. I just, you know, just clean me up and that's it. I don't put... They try to put, They always try to put the clear. I say, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. But I, I just think that that's a good breaking the mold. For men like you guys as well who have never done it, maybe you do this one time and you be like, "Wow, this felt great. I'm gonna do this all the time." And as, and then being in a relationship, I think no, it's a no, cool no. thing when you're in a relationship and you go with your girl or your but wife I, to get. Your I may have to have belly. my wife do my feet first, so that the person, the professional that's Trust doing me, my feet, ladies, doesn't retire. Those ladies, what? Those ladies have seen everything. I'm telling you. I don't you know. You haven't seen. You haven't seen my talents. Dude, you I was seen doing my, my feet one time and I saw a guy walked in. And he had sandals on, and I was like, "Oh my god, I feel sorry for that lady." And yeah. she took she took it like a trooper. She put that shit on, and then they start it's funny. talking. It's and funny you, know you said that. Saying? You said she took it like a trooper. I was just thinking that like the most traumatized people in society have to be like cops, the military, fire department, <laughs> and people who do mani pedis. Yeah. Those are those Men's are really pedis. those are feet responders, not first responders. You got to have respect for the for the feet responders. Well, listen, I, uh, love you know, I, lo- I, I, love, I love this break in the mold, but I, I, I don't want to go too far on the show without, yeah. uh, I would like to bring up, because uh, I know we're getting close to where we're walking the walk, but before we do that, man, we really didn't get to talk about our previous two guests, so I just thought we should, we should bring them up real quick, you know what I mean? Nick Alexander mm-hmm. was on two weeks ago, and his story was so powerful, and you know, just being so open and honest with everybody, I thought that was amazing, you know what I'm saying, Edgar, mm-hmm. you know? Your opinion I, I, um, on, on what he brought to the table? He, um, I thought, I thought ex- he brought exactly what we wanted as a guest to the table. You know, I, I tell people this, and I get a lot of hits. Yo, I will do the show with you, and I'm like, it, not that I'm being picky. I want someone to come on this show and really use it for what it was worth. You know, you have two comics, but you also have a professional that can help you. And I thought Nick did great. I, I, I followed up with him actually, like I always do after we get the guests and Momo as well. But um, I talked to him, and then a few days later, when he got to see the episode after it came out, he hit me up, and he was really like, like I could hear, like he was down about it. You know, I guess it's one thing is doing it, and then one thing is actually seeing yourself, you know, and looking at yourself, expressing what you're expressing, and and um, he hit me up, and and I told him, I said, Nick, you know, um, this is part of the process. This is the way I see it. From my two walking the walks that were really deep, the the way I see it is. Once we once we accept we have a problem, once we talk about it, once we let something that's bothering us out, yeah, the mind will take over. You would think about it, but eventually, as the days goes by, the pain goes away, and and it goes away, and then you just feel better about the fact that you're not hiding this no more. And it's exactly what I told Nick. Um, I appreciate Dr. Dan because Dr. Dan actually um, is going to do a, a private you know session with Nick on on his walk in the walk which i think is great and thank you dr dan i mean i think that's that's a beautiful thing from your part so dr dan's gonna do a a one-on-one follow-up with nick and and hopefully that will help him you know but from now i spoke to him a couple of days ago and he 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 was great he was great um how about momo 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 broke the mold like like no one broke the mold. Um, his I think Momo mold don't exist for Momo. There is no mold for Momo. <laughs> he was a uh, I, I I you know I I liked what he brought. I love I love what they broke what they both brought was just a, a raw honesty. I thought I thought Momo was was brutally honest and mm-hmm. at at a place where he had done a lot of self reflection and was and was ready to 
expressed mm-hmm. where he was in at, at this point in his life and the way he used his his career as a shield to kind of transform a bad part of his life and just kind of step out of his own world. Just a lot of the stuff, you know, I th- I just thought they both were great. And uh, Edgar, I know you said you want people to come on that are ready to take advantage of it. I say the challenge is to get them on when they're maybe not quite ready, but they'll be ready by the end of the show because they had a conversation with us and, mm-hmm. and, they, and they follow our lead. Because sometimes that's maybe I think where we can get some of the most honest reaction is someone that maybe didn't think they were ready to share. And all of a sudden they get caught up in a conversation of men having real men talk. And the next thing you know, they're talking about something they hadn't even thought about before they came on the show. Because I, I can't see someone trying to be hilariously funny and be a clown when we're talking about the things that we're talking about. So that's something I just think we should consider when we think about uh, who we talk to in the future. But on that note, uh, we want to get to the, what I think we all agree is the most important and in some cases the most challenging part of the show is uh, yeah. walking the walk. And this I'll, week's- I'll, this. I'll, I'll bring him in, I'll bring him in. Bring him in, bring him in. <clears throat> I'm happy, I'm happy when when we started doing this. Remember we talked about bringing guests and then afterwards just going back to ourselves, you know, so we could recap on each other. So Dr. Dan said he wanted to walk the walk and I'm glad that, that we got this chance to do it. So walking the walk, if you're listening or viewing for the first time, is we can't come up here and tell you that it's okay to talk and tell you to talk and find someone to talk and vent out if we don't practice what we preach. So walking the walk is a time where we come on, we talk about something that's bothering us now, has bothered us in the past, or something that you want to get off your chest. And, you know, with that being said, the, the very talented and wonderful Dr. Dan gets to walk the walk today. Go ahead, brother. So I, I said... You know, I, the reason I said this at the beginning that, that I was nervous about this is actually that I have a long history uh, of people not understanding me, um, un- not understanding what hurts most. So when I walked the walk about my daughter uh, being born and the whole way that changed things, the, the, the way you guys responded to me, I just want you to know, was not the typical way people have responded to me. And some of that may be the way that I presented. I don't know. Because I, here's the way I experience myself. I have a lot of pain in me, a lot of emotional pain. And I have it so much that I really became guarded. I could talk about it. I could say the words. I would say anything. It's kind of like how I would say that, uh, oh, I'll do a Manny Petty. But then, you know, when you brought it up first, I was like, ah! (laughs) So... I have certain responses in me when I talk about something really vulnerable where I get very worried right away. And I don't usually talk about it this way. I'll I'll go ahead and talk about it, and then the people tend to respond in the way that they respond, which isn't particularly aligned with me, and then I just close it off. And you never even know what happened. So that's why I wanted to put that out there first. Because this may not sound like that big of a deal to you, but I want to explain why it was. So... I went into this particular therapy for particular reasons. And um, one of them was, it it was a particular form of therapy. It's called psychoanalysis. People talk about that. It's like, you know, what Sigmund Freud did and how it's evolved. But it's the kind of thing where you go in three or four days a week and it's like really intense. And I went in in part because I, I'll just freely admit this. I went in because my brother had done it and I wanted to win his approval. That was a big part of why I went in. And I I also went in thinking, you know, I've been through years of therapy, but I'm always behaving myself in therapy. I always go in and I'm like, I'm going to tell you what's really going on, but I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to be likable and I'm going to be easy for the therapist. And I was always had my mind on that. And this time I decided, I was like, I need something different. I need to go ahead and just be really honest with this person. And so in a way, I, I gave more trust to this this therapist than I had given to therapists before this. Um, and that was a good thing. Uh, I didn't end up, it didn't turn out well. But I still think it's good that I did it. And it did set the stage for me being able to do it later. But here's basically what happened. Uh, it seemed pretty apparent early on that 
this guy would be, uh, he would challenge me in certain ways. And I thought that was a good thing. I was like, oh, good. You know, I'll get a lot out of this then. But looking back on it now, I think I was not recognizing certain signs of, of some things that just were not, they didn't line up well with what I needed. I needed to be able to tell somebody what was going on in my life and what had happened to me and have them be more empathic to me than I, even I was. And what I found was the exact opposite. This guy, I, I don't know that I would describe him as somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder, but I do think that he was quite narcissistic, not in the good way. And what ended up happening is I, I was trying to tell him about all the things that I was really angry about, the things that I don't usually say to people. And he was so critical of me about it. You know, he, he there's a certain form of therapy that, and I guess maybe certain ways that people do it, that tries to get the person to face their responsibility for things. And that could be helpful for some people, but I'm a person who takes responsibility way too much. And he, I, I'm just going to go out and say it, I think he is a terrible therapist. Terrible. And he missed so many obvious signs of what was needed. But when you're in therapy, it's a very vulnerable place to be. So I just want to encourage everybody out there, protect yourself uh, when you go into therapy. Make sure you find somebody who appreciates you. If they don't, run fucking screaming from that door because you can get really messed up that way. And that is essentially what happened to me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of how it unfolded, and then we can talk a little bit about what you guys think about this. But for... I'm a very persistent guy, and I'm a very committed person, and I wasn't seeing how bad this was for me. Uh, when you, when you, uh, when you've grown up in a situation where you were affected by narcissists, um, you can sometimes not see when you're, when you're in it again. I see it now. I stay away from relationships like this. But what happened is I started telling him about you know various things and things like I would say. You know, I my brother, when he went to his... And I was starting to tell him, like, you're upsetting me. You're saying these things that are not aligned with me. And he would have some kind of negative interpretation, always. I said to him at one point, my brother went to see uh, a psychoanalyst, who was the guy who recommended this guy, by the way. Uh, and he said this phrase to my brother that um, I wish somebody had said to me. And the phrase was, uh, you know, my brother was talking about various problems that he had. And that analyst said to him, you came by it honestly. And what that means is, uh, you had some bad things happen to you. You didn't make this happen yourself. So I was saying this to the, the to my analyst. Um, and he just... I don't even remember exactly what he said. It was so bad that I can't really remember it uh, fully, but I know that basically what he said was that he didn't think that was true with me. That, you know, and to me it felt like he invalidated my suffering very badly in that one session. But then I kept at this for nine and a half years. I kept going because I was so desperate to win the approval and the love of these people that I could not win the love and approval for, that that setup that I had sent me into an absolute buzzsaw in this situation. And I kept at it. I kept trying to win his approval, and I kept at it, and I kept at it, and I kept at it. And I, I would sometimes be like, okay, fine, I, will, I'll, I won't push on what I'm saying. I'll be a good patient. I'll listen to what you're saying. I'll integrate it. And I got some good things out of that in the therapy, but that was to my credit, not to this guy's. But what I ended up feeling uh, was that it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. In a very, um, in a way that kind of made me feel like I was losing my mind. Like he would say, he would say things like, um, God, I can't, I'm, I'm like almost, I'm blanking out on this, which shows you how bad it was. Like, 
I'm having trouble even talking about it. We may need to do more follow-up on this because it's it's hard for me to get the full grasp of. But I remember at one point him saying that uh, he he felt like I required a lot of him somehow because I was always saying I was upset with him in some way. And I, I started, and I, I have, I'm not a confrontational guy, but I, I refused to back down. And I said, you're saying that I require a lot of you, but I traipse around New York City, come here four days a week while you sit on your ass in this chair and don't move anywhere. And I pay you when, even when, uh, if I go on vacation, but you're still working, I still pay you. This was one of his terrible policies. I was like, how are you calling me inflexible? You are the inflexible one. So uh, I was so angry. And these kinds, of thi- these, these kinds of things would happen over and over and over and over. I remember one time I was talking to him and uh, I said something about like, oh, you know, I, I was saying something about this is totally off topic in a way, but it does fit. I was talking about how lobsters, when they're cooked, they make a noise like it's screaming. And I was like, it's too disturbing. I could never do that. And he was criticizing me for the fact that I like could never cook a lobster because I think, why would you criticize somebody for that? I was empathic to the lobster. I, I, and he was like, well, you know, they're actually not screaming. It's, it's the sound of air coming out of their shells. And I was like, you're missing the point, man. <laughs> it was always like that. We were always butting heads. And I just ended up feeling like, you know, I trusted this person with some of my hardest pains. And and with, with my, what I would say is like my precious childhood anger. And he kept betraying it over and over and over and over. And eventually I, I started freaking out. I was like, what am I going to do? because I'm going to have to end this therapy. But it felt like it felt like after that much intensity and trying to make it work so much, it felt like ending a marriage in a way. Um, and I had extreme anxiety, much more than I've ever had before. Uh, like where I just felt like I was going to die. It was that bad. And that shows you what kind of intens- intensity I was having about this. And you know, when I think about it, really, I had been looking for father figures my whole life. I figured, hey, if a therapist, you know, if I can't find my own therapist to love me, then nobody will love me. And that's what it felt like then. That that and it, and and that felt so bad. And then on top of it, I was going through something that I felt like nobody would understand. Everybody would be like, "Big deal, it's a therapist," you know, like. But what was, what was really happening is I felt like. My brother, who I had a lot of conflict with, went to the same type of treatment and they loved him. And this guy did not love me. He fucking hated me. And I hate him. (laughs) But the fact that he didn't, that he didn't love me at all and he thought I was just the worst from what I could tell, it was pretty soul crushing. And then there was the anxiety on top of it and there was no one to help me with it. And usually when you need help, you go to a therapist. So I was like even more up a creek. And on top of it, I'm a therapist who's starting to lose faith in therapy. If this kind of thing could go on. So to make a long story short, although I've already made it long. Uh, I really ended up feeling like I needed to leave this therapy. I told my wife I needed to leave this therapy. I told my mom I needed to leave this therapy. And this is this is a um, so one of the biggest parts of the whole uh, mind fuck of it all. Sorry for the language, but I, this brings up a lot of feeling for me. Not one person told me I should leave that therapy. Nobody. I told them what. Actually, that's not true. I did have a friend who did. Um, not in a forceful way, but he was like, "I I don't like this for you." I had so few people in my life who who could really see my pain and and would show up. And so what ended up happening is I did tell him that I was ending the therapy and I did it in a way that I felt pretty good about me. And I felt very empowered 
in a way for the first time in my life, but I also felt completely alone. Like nobody would understand what I was going through. I was having anxiety like to um, worse than anything I've ever experienced. I felt like nobody cared about me. I felt suicidal. Um, I, I had, you know, I have my two girls and, and that was the most protective thing because I was just like, no, I will, I'll never do that to them. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to be alive. I did not. Um, if, if, if it were an easy option and there were no consequences and I wasn't going to hurt anybody and I could just press a button, yes or no, for life, I would have just been like, no. And I thought, I didn't know if I would ever go back to therapy. It felt like help was broken. So now what did I do? So I was in a pretty dire situation. And ultimately, I did get a lot out of this, including recognizing what I had wanted was a father figure who would who would um, tell me I was valid. And ironically, I got that for myself. I just recognized, okay, I don't need any father figures at all. But the process was really ugly. The process was very hard. Um, I've never felt so bad in my life. It was at least a full year of that. Um, and nobody understood it. I, uh, maybe one or two friends did, but mostly nobody. Um, so that's the story. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny. The funny thing is, as I told it, I told it with more feeling than I've ever told this before. I tried to really walk the walk and talk about how painful this was. I don't know how well I captured it, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Can I ask you, um, did obviously you were a therapist when you were going to this therapist Were you were already in therapy and did he know this? Yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Edgar. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, just for what you described to me uh, sounds remarkably like an abusive relationship, mm-hmm. uh, an emotionally abusive relationship that, and most people in an abusive relationship stay in them for long periods of time for a lot of the similar reasons that you just said. Um, why do you think you wanted your brother's approval so much, despite the fact that you had conflict with him, that you would enter this type of therapy just to earn his approval, despite not being terribly close? Um, I mean, it's interesting. My my brother and I, my relationship is is complicated. We actually are, in some ways, we're very close or have been very close, and then in other ways, there's just so much conflict he and I went through some horrible stuff together. Um, But we also experienced it very differently and very separately. And I, I just wasn't seeing clearly that I wasn't seeing clearly my own story. Here's a way of thinking about it. I think that I was feeling like, you know, I don't know. I didn't have a father through much of my life. Um, And my, the father that adopted me, who I do call my dad and think of as my dad, um, provided a lot of stuff, but some things just you can't replace. I was always trying to fill some kind of void, and I think a lot of times I felt like when I would be with my brother, uh, I would feel really, um, and he was approving of me, it made a big difference. And he ha- he has made a big difference in my life in certain ways, in the ways that he did approve of me. You know, like he he's the one who thinks that I'm so funny, and is he older? Is he older? He's an you? older brother. Yeah. By how much? By much? Uh, oh, wow. Almost three years. Almost three years. And can um, I ask you something, Doctor Dan, real quick? Yeah. Because um, you we, you talked about it before, but <clears throat> you say your father passed away when you were very young. How, yep. how young? Six Again, weeks one, old. Six weeks old, right? At what age would you say you felt that trauma? Because I mean, at six weeks old, you know, you don't really know, so. <clears throat> was it when you got to school and you started seeing the difference in, in other boys and then having and you not having or was I think it was a it was a slow drip right from the start. Um I didn't process it the way that a person who's fully aware would process that, but 
it left me with a sense of difference across the board. And that included my relationship with my brother because it was pretty confusing, I think, for us. There was no, there wasn't a dad there. We kind of relied on each other in certain ways, but we were just little kids. And, um, you know, I think that, I think that we ended up um, feeling quite confused about all this. And so, like I said, it was a slow drip. It could be, I'd go to school and I'd hear something about somebody's father. I was actually, I was recently watching, um, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert for anybody who likes the show Ted Lasso, which is a great show, but there's a character in it who has a really bad dad. Terrible. Abusive. And he hears somebody else t- talking to his dad, and it's a good relationship, and it just tears his heart out. Mm-hmm. And I think I experienced a lot of stuff like that, but I didn't know. I, I, di- I wasn't even processing that. I just knew that a lot of stuff felt bad. (laughs) I couldn't. So when did I actually go? When did I actually go through the process? It was around this issue, this, this ending of this therapy relationship. And this is why it was so bad. I was fully processing. Oh my God. I have been looking for father figures my whole life. Didn't even realize it exactly. I kind of knew I I was aware of it, but I didn't realize how significant it was. And none of them were ever going to be there for me. Mm. So that's this is when I processed it. I think the fact that um, he accepted your brother, you know, I mean, I could see how that happens. And you're like, what, what, what's wrong with me? You know what I'm saying? And the fact that you were looking for that fatherly figure. But then I know this walk in the walk. Like a lot of people will be like, wait, what is it? But I could tell that it's coming from a real place because the whole time I've met you, I've never heard you curse. I've never heard you drop an F-bomb. I've never heard you like express it, right? And now my concern is, and we, we talked about this before on when you're looking for a therapist, what to look for in a therapist when you're looking, when you're seeking for help. And here we have a therapist who went through a therapist and and dude, yeah, narcissistic to the to the fullest. And, and my concern is, are there a lot of therapists out there that do this just to keep their clients coming back or challenge them? And you know, like, it, it, because you say he didn't help you, but yet you went to him for nine years. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's crazy to hear your story and and hear how a therapist could feel that bad for another therapist. And I and to the to the contrary, I think. This this story has made you a way better therapist. Oh, I think it has, but it almost killed me. <laughs> I was gonna. Yeah. That was gonna. It, sh- it shouldn't have been the painful process that it was. Um, I, I I wonder if because he knew you were a therapist that he took a different approach with you, thinking that you should have the tools to fix yourself. Like, uh, you know, that's like if I go to a firefighter for advice, I, you know, he brings me gasoline and and matches. No, that's not what I wanted. You know, listen, I, maybe he thinks you already had the tools. To do it, and he didn't take a personal approach. It just sounds like he he had no sense of who you were as a person. It's almost as if he didn't listen to you. He just said what he thought that you needed to hear. I think you're on the right track, but I'm going to say something about how I've come to see it, and I do think I'm right about this. I think he was competitive with me. I think that he saw me as a threat. He saw how good a therapist I, I was, and he tried to tear me down for it. Mm. I really think that's what happened. Mm-hmm. In other words, like you took advantage. He definitely took advantage. He knew that he knows the person that you are and how challenging you are with yourself. And it, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying every therapist out there is great or perfect, but yeah, there's people that took take advantage of of, of clients like that. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep them coming. As opposed to saying, you know what, I could give this person one good advice, and this per- that advice might help them forever. But no, why? You know. Yeah, well, and it's, and it's I'll sad. tell you, as a therapist, one of the challenging things is to keep your own stuff out of the situation. You know, when I meet with, with patients, one of the things that I make sure to do is to think about, um, I think about who they are. I keep myself out of it. I'm like, I do not belong here. I mean, I will tell them about me, but mm-hmm. I'm not the one who knows. So... I think I was always good at this, and I think he he just he wanted to get me out the door the minute I walked in. I think I made him very uncomfortable, and I'm I'm not sorry about it. I, I and I, I gave him a hard time, and he deserved it. 
Um, hmm. But I'm actually pretty proud of myself, what I did there, and that I survived I it and, and came out on the other side a better, a much better therapist because of it. But man, mm -hmm. it was hard. And I can, yeah, I can imagine. I, I mean, not knowing you personally, but knowing you in the months that we've known each other and seeing your persona and how you are as a man, I could imagine how that must have drove you crazy, you know. And, it, and it's and just it's, funny it's, how it all goes. Hard. It all starts with with the loss of 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 of, of, a, of a person that he could have no conception of knowing, but yet infiltrated every part of his life until this day. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you yeah. know, and it, I think you know it's it's funny. Yeah, I wonder if your brother. I'm pretty sure your brother has some sense of memory uh, that you just couldn't possess because you start to do form early memories when you're two or three years old, which is the age he would have been when your dad left. So I, I wonder if uh, I wonder if his his concept of him has got to be somewhat different than yours, and how differently that impacted I think, I think him. it's very different, and he also suffered a much more conscious loss. I mean, he has certain mm -hmm. pains that I do not have, mm -hmm. but I have certain pains that he doesn't have. You know, and mm -hmm. I think this does fit in what, what we were talking about, about narcissism, because the worst part when you're dealing with a narcissist is they will make you so confused, you'll think you're insane. And that they'll gas, they'll gaslight you. It was gaslighting. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. that's what this guy was doing. And he was doing it from the absolute worst, almost most reprehensible position he could. That, that's a violation because the, the most vulnerable relationship, one of the most vulnerable relationships is between a therapist and a patient because it's the one place where the patient should be able to completely let their guard down and have no worries for repercussions. And it sounds like all you got was, was judgment and disdain for expressing yourself. So um, I'm sure, I'm sure it, made, it, it made you a much better therapist. I just wish you didn't have to go through nine years of what you went through, especially the last year where it seemed where you were just almost hopeless. I, I, I'm sorry that you had to go through that aspect of it, but I am glad you came out the other side, uh, you know, the person that you are. Well, thank you. And, and that you never and that you never gave up because you said no one understood it. No one knew what you were going through. You know, I mean, I, I, I understand. I felt I felt your pain just listening to you, you know, just I felt your frustration. I felt your anger. And. Yeah, like it's just like Eric said, but I'm sorry that you had to go through that, you know. But truly now, knowing you now and meeting you now, I think you're the the greatest at what you do. You know, you're amazing, you know. And I think a lot has to do with that experience that at one point was so fucking hard and, and you know, and, and you didn't understand. But at the end of the day, it made you a better man, you know. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Dan. Yep, then Dan, thank you. Thank you, guys. You know, I appreciate it. It's, it's healing to say it to people um, who are working to understand what I'm saying about it and, and clearly are understanding a lot of what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. How man. long, even, ago, even how long ago was this, Dan, before we close it out? How long ago was this? Uh, this was uh, about five years ago now. So this oh, wasn't wow. a long time ago. No, not particularly. No, a lot has, and a lot has changed since then. I've, like, I've cut every every narcissist out of my life, and I was like, oh my god, I have like ten of them. <laughs> I had collected mm -hmm. them; they're all gone. Once you once you realize and you see that you see the narcissist in someone, you know, you you tend. I mean, it's up to you if you want to stay there and take it, but you tend to see it, and, and, and little by little, cut them out. No, let, let, let me say, you. I want to say one last thing about it because I think this is a useful thing for the people who are listening out there. That was when I fired that therapist, in a way, that was the first time I had ever been fully in my own corner, ever. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I have been much more in my own corner for the rest of my life. So mm -hmm. you got you to make a choice to be uh, aligned with yourself and behind yourself and believe that you're a good person and doesn't do not deserve to be abused. Yeah, exactly. And and try to recognize that that MPD, you know, in people and when you're looking for help. That's why I always say and I always say this to the viewers and listeners, man, we ask you and we encourage you to talk, not to hold something in. If something is bothering you, let it out. 
but not everyone is going to be that ear that we need. Not everyone is going to give us what we, you know, at the end of the day, it's not, I'm not talking to you because I want your response and I want you to fix my problems. I'm talking to you because I just want to vent it out. And all we need at times is to listen. And that's what this podcast has done. So I listen to you, you know, I listen to you and I don't want to tell you, oh, Dr. Dan, this could have done this, that and that. But I just listen to you and I try to understand your pain and feel your pain. And and I'm glad that that you got that off your chest. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad that you got off the chest. I think you are a great person overall and everything. You've helped me like everything. And Eric has to. Eric has to. I got I forgot. But I got to I got to give props to Eric. Don't, you don't have to do that. Listen, no, Dan, no, no, by no, the way, no, no. Eric, when, Eric has when we're to. off the air, when we're off the air, Dan, I want you to give us the name. An address of this guy. <laughs> Listen, no, but Eric oh, well. has two. And even last week. <laughs> you got week Bronx after, friends, buddy. You got Bronx <laughs> friends now. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but um, even even with with Eric and, and the fact that he took on this podcast with me, knowing how he was, you know, and how he felt about podcasts, but the fact that he came on here with me last week after Momo's episode, we had a, like an hour long conversation afterwards. And 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 I see the change in you, brother, as a man. You know, as you told me, you seen the change in me and opening up. And I think this platform is making us better, better. And whoever we bring on could be be better, and eventually, and hopefully, we could send that message that we could be better men, y'all. We could be a better man. Let that machismo shit go. Let all that, and, and, and you know, and talk. And and I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. I, I'm thankful for you as well, bro. You've been there for me a lot through this year. And and I appreciate both of you guys, man. So thank you, Dr. Dan, for that walk in the walk. Next time, Thanks, you know, Dan. now I'm going to have to do walk the walk. Damn. Is it my turn afterwards or is it Eric? It's Eric's, right? Oh, no, it's mine. It's mine. It's actually so next yours. Time, <laughs> next time we get a solo three uh, three amigo part of the show, I'll definitely do walk in the walk. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you for the feedback. I've gotten a lot of great feedback. Like I said, man, please share this video with any of your friends. If you feel like you know a guy in your life or, or a man in your life that could take from this video, Please share it. Write your comments down below, man. Please comment. Comment. Tell me how you break the mold. And, and, and yo, it's interesting to hear a therapist complain about another therapist. So thank you, Dr. Dan, yo. With that being said, anything else, Eric, you want to add? Um, no, just um, I think the most one of the most important aspects of therapy is to choose the right therapist and to choose a therapist that works best for you, not a therapist that wants to kind of force you to fit their mold. And, and I think mm -hmm. that it's important that you treat it like a medical condition. If, if you had a, some kind of diagnosis, you'd want a second opinion. Don't think your Thank first you. choice is your only choice. There are good Thank therapists you. out there. Nice. Thank you. All right, well said, and, and thank you guys. All right, I will take us out as usual. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and we will get back to you personally. Peace, brothers in arms. Brothers in arms. Oh,